Perfect. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to episode three of our series of uh, the value of clean webinars. Uh, very happy to have you all here today. Um, I think it's important to note and say thank you to everybody for carving time out of their busy schedules today. We know that all of you have options when it comes to spending uh, that precious resource of time in different places. And we, uh, we, we were very thankful that you're here with us today and want to uh, make sure that you understand we're not gonna take that for granted. And we have a presentation today that uh, should be worthy of that precious resource. So uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, I think we're going to get started after a couple of introductions here, but uh, just a quick note on why I guess this is important, uh, why it's impactful to all of us, this particular topic that is. Um, it has the potential to have both positive and negative impact 24 seven in our lives really. And that uh, <clears throat> goes, you know, whether it's in our professional lives, in the uh, tasks that we have on a daily or weekly basis, uh, and those responsibilities when we're on the clock, uh, and then when we're off the clock in our personal lives, uh, whether we're out and about with family and friends visiting our favorite restaurant or venue for some form of entertainment. This is something again, that can have positive or negative impact on all of us basically in every facet of our lives. So uh, again, this is the, the title of this particular episode is Savvy Sanitation, the Food Service Edition. And uh, we're very fortunate to have with us a panel of experts and uh, uh, topic uh, experts on this, this particular topic, uh, starting with Mr. Bill Garvey, an Imperial Dade uh, uh, resource of ours that we lean on very heavily for situations like this, John Thomas, and uh, John Leedy, or Jim, sorry, Jim Leedy, sorry, Jim, uh, is also going to be with us today. My name is Brian Rested. I'll be your host this morning, uh, one of the sales managers here in the Minneapolis market. And uh, oh, just to make sure that you guys are all aware, we are recording this uh, session, so it can be played back at another time, or any questions that come up are going to be part of that recording. Also, we've we've muted everybody's lines just to keep the uh, background noise at a minimum. Um, and and if you have questions throughout, please utilize the the chat uh, portal, and we'll be monitoring that on a regular basis. So. Um, uh, it is also important to note and thank the uh, sponsors of this event. These things don't happen. These productions don't come to fruition without the uh, sponsorship uh, support or partnership uh, of Georgia Pacific and Clorox for today's uh, presentation. So thank you very much for those guys uh, to making this happen. Uh, I would say without further ado, we can kick this off and I'm going to pass the mic, get out of the way and pass the mic to Bill McGarvey. Bill, you are on. Looks like you're muted, Bill. There we go. Apologies, folks. I uh, trouble with my connection this morning. Again, the uh, the value of clean webinar series is really a, a way for us to bring uh, a lot of information to our to you, our customers, as well as many of our sales consultants are attending these webinars as well. So. This one um, certainly aimed at business owners, facility manager, managers, and cleaning professionals that are involved in food sanitation in one, one degree or another. Um, can you advance the slide there, please? So you, you've met Brian. Uh, I'm Bill McGarvey, as, as Brian mentioned, and uh, John Thomas will be coming up here in a moment and followed by Jim Leedy and I'll, I'll wrap us up towards the end and Brian will have some closing comments for us. So our, to start our presentation here, why is sanitation important in food service? And I think Brian touched on a number of uh, concerns there in his opening comments. But just this morning here in the, the Philadelphia area, I, I heard on the news before I ran out the door uh, Trader Joe's is having a recall today for uh, cashews, and I, I I will defer to Mr. Thomas. Maybe he heard whether it was salmonella or what the illness that's associated with that, um, and and he's certainly going to be talking about some of those things here in just a moment. But the the real importance behind you know why is it so important? Obviously, minimally 
if we get this wrong, we could make people sick. If we carry that even further, unfortunately, that, that illness could become fatal in certain situations. So that that's, uh, I think, the real reason for us to talk about this today. It's why it's so important. So if we could, let's move on to our objectives for the uh, for the webinar today. Um, we want to understand the need for effective an effective food safety plan. Learn some of the components of effective cleaning and sanitizing with regard to food service and explore some of the training tips to help change or alter worker behavior. So with that, I'd like to hand it off now to John Thomas. John is our Director of Health and Wellness for Imperial Dade. I've had the pleasure of working with John now for well over a decade and, and what he brings um, from his experience and his uh, his subject matter expertise in this world, in this realm is uh, is really invaluable. So John, if you would take it away. Uh, thank you, Bill. And uh, your check is in the mail. So I appreciate those comments. And uh, thank you for all those that have joined us here today. Uh, it's interesting that, that Bill brought up the uh, Trader Joe's uh, situation. And I did actually hear that. And we'll talk about that actually here in a few minutes. Uh, if you want to, okay, well, we jumped over a few things. Uh, really, I started my career as a food microbiologist, and I know firsthand the importance of actually having a, a food safety plan and how that's pivotal in really preventing negative outcomes you know, for your customers and for your staff. And as part of that plan, it's key to understand you know, what uh, those threats are and, and what the source of those negative out to cause those negative outcomes. Uh, a primary concern, and, and really just as referenced by Bill there already, is uh, the spread of foodborne illness and that threat. Uh, and these headlines uh, I pulled actually from, you know, for the past few years, uh, one was an outbreak of hepatitis A at an Italian restaurant in the Philadelphia area. Uh, actually, there was three deaths associated with that. Uh, the restaurant was closed for several months as they investigated this outbreak. Uh, and I uh, can imagine the impact on that business. I'm not even sure if that if the if the you know, if the restaurant is still open, actually, uh, it did. It was allowed to reopen at some point. But more recently, actually, in the Chicago area, there was a high school uh, noted here as Huntley High School. Uh, it was a part of an E. coli outbreak. Uh, there was nine people that got sick <clears throat> at that high school, but it was actually a fairly wide ranging outbreak covered, I think, uh, 10 states and was related. Eventually, the investigation showed that had to do with an infected food handler uh, who was handling, uh, actually, he was on the cookie line and the salad line, uh, touching basically ready to eat food. Uh, and he was actually shedding that sugar toxic, sugar toxin producing E. coli. Well, that's a mouthful. But anyway, again, these are impacts. The restaurant potentially could be out of business. Obviously, a school is, um, is not going out of business. But with any of these investigations, when you talk to food service operators uh, running commercial kitchens, whenever they get uh, their inspections or whether it be the state or local uh, municipal health code people. Uh, it's one thing when you actually are investigated for an outbreak, every record that you've had over the past five years. And that was the thing that I read the report there on that uh, high school. Uh, they went through all their records and they found inconsistencies, lapsed record keeping. And I imagine uh, a lot of people were uh, severely impacted by uh, you know, really from from that investigation. So moving on to the next slide. You know, these threats again, they range and we'll talk about this, you know, pathogens related to the foodborne illness, but even more now, not so much a, a foodborne illness, but the impact of allergens on our uh, uh, restaurant and food service industry and, and, and managing that uh, with their customers. And all this again gets built into that food safety plan and uh, when we think about that plan, it, we have to recognize that a plan recognizes that that stuff just doesn't happen. Okay, you know, we, we plan for this. And uh, when we're building these plans, we need to make sure that we look at, uh, you know, what are the regulations? Uh, an operation like ServeSafe, which is really a gold standard training, food safety training program in the food industry, can provide the guidance needed uh, to put these plans together. Uh, so you can identify those risks and those threats and then make sure that you have the, the the countermeasures in place to take care of that. But just having that doesn't mean that it happens. It really does reflect what the ownership 
and management is uh, focused on uh, what actions do they really communicate. And many times we see where there might be an operation but because of, you know, what's happening in the kitchen, uh, an employee fails to wash their hands properly. This was identified in that uh, E. coli outbreak at that school. Do we take that and make that a trainable moment or do we just say, okay, just go back on the line? Okay, and that sends the message that hand hygiene isn't that critical. And as we talk here in a few minutes, we'll see that it's critical for all aspects of foodborne illness. So again, all these uh, actions will impact decisions that our employees make with regards to cleaning, sanitizing, and personal hygiene, which really are key factors in these uh, in these uh, outbreaks. Next slide, please. So here's some of the the, the top uh, most wanted lists, I guess, for foodborne illnesses. Uh, uh, there's a lot of bacterial uh, and other types of pathogens out there. Uh, that we do worry about, but these are the six that are focused on. If you can control these six, for the most part, you are controlling the other ones. Uh, four of these pathogens are bacterial. That would be your Shigella, your Salmonellas, uh, and then that E. coli, that's the, the, the sugar toxin producing one. That was the one related to that Chicago outbreak, uh, which was just, again, that was just in December of uh, 2023. Uh, and really being bacterial, these are the ones that... Uh, really are impacted by that what we call the temperature danger zone, the range of temperatures from 41 to 135 degrees Fahrenheit, where bacteria will grow. So if we're not, you know, managing our foods properly as we hold them, uh, then we can actually run the risk of actually having uh, bacterial growth in that food. And then even within that temp temperature danger zone, there's that 70 to 125 degree Fahrenheit where pathogens love to grow. Again, pathogens, you know, love our bodies, 98.6. So the closer you get to 98.6, that's when pathogens really do like to uh, proliferate. So again, there's bacterial uh, pathogens, we need to control temperatures. Uh, when we look at these, this list here, it kind of tells us what the source is. So again, your Shigella, again, it's, it's about contaminated uh, surfaces, but really that's a human source or insects is related to the spread of that. Uh, Bill mentioned uh, Trader Joe's here today. They just mentioned salmonella, but it's related to an agricultural product. It was uh, packaged cashews, which tells me it was the non-typhoidal, which is non-human related. That comes from uh, basically uh, uh, your, your, your the food source itself, whether it be animal or poultry or actually produce can be uh, contaminated with salmonella at the source. Uh, salmonella typhi, that is what we used to think of as typhoid fever, but that is a human source. So if there's a, type, a salmonella typhi outbreak in a facility, then it's related to people and brought that infection in. And then we got E. coli the same way that actually is human, or as we saw with the Chicago outbreak, that is actually also human, or it actually is in the food supply itself. Uh, poultry, eggs, you know, dairy products can be contaminated. Uh, the two remaining pathogens there are, are viral, uh, and all your viral pathogens are human sourced. So hepatitis A, that was that Italian restaurant. Somebody infected brought that into that building, and then that infected person could then contaminate surfaces, contaminate food products, and spread it to other people. And the same way with norovirus, we're all very familiar with norovirus. Norovirus is the number one cause of foodborne outbreaks and illnesses. Uh, over 60% of the cases relate to norovirus. It is highly um, infectious. And uh, again, we used to know it as the stomach flu. It is not related to the flu. It does have some seasonality, but again, it is a leading cause of uh, uh, of infection. It's also all of these, we talk about you know, sort of contaminated hands. Hand washing is key and personal hygiene is key at managing the spread of these uh, types of in, uh pathogens within a facility. And one thing that and Bill will address on this a little bit is when we talk about uh, many of these, uh, especially noroviruses, phrases that I've heard, that is uh, explosive diarrhea and projectile vomiting. Well, that material is extremely infectious. So when we clean up that, we have to make sure that our, our staffs are trained uh, to do that properly and safely so as to eliminate that infection threat. So again, these are the types of things that we need to be thinking about and building in. Again, this is what's built in to that safety plan. How do we deal with that? Next slide, please. 
So again, I mentioned that there's a number of other pathogens, and this is actually recognized in the newest edition of the food code, as well as uh, the serve safe training program uh, for managers. Uh, that is uh, things like spore formers. These are bacterial uh, pathogens. The two listed there, uh, C. botulinum and C. Per perfringes. Uh, botulinum, as we many of you know, it causes botulism. Uh, a high mortality rate with botulism. It's related to improper preserving, improper canning. Uh, but it's a close cousin to it is the perfringens. And that is actually related to, it's in the environment, and it's related to improper handling of food and storage temperatures. This is where the old thing about, you know, keeping it hot or keeping it cold. Uh, so C. perfringens loves it when it's like 110 degrees. So if you have something on a warming table, and it's not being kept at 135 or above like it's supposed to, uh, it'll grow, proliferate, and produce a toxin that causes a, you know, a foodborne illness. Uh, people tell me, uh, ask me, uh, you know, what's the difference? How do I know the difference between the two of those? Well, as we learned in microbiology, if you've got botulism, uh, you think you're going to die, and you do. Um, if you've been infected with perfringens, uh, you think you're going to die, but you get over it. So, Again, that's really the only way to tell it. Now, obviously, there's better sophisticated ways of doing that. Uh, there's some other ones, uh, Staphylococcus aureus. We think about that as an environmental uh, illness. You know, we hear MRSA, and it is. It's a, it's a, it's prevalent in the environment, uh, but also get in the food. And this is related to cold foods. So your salads, your coleslaws, your potato, you know, your macaroni salads, if they're kept again in that temperature danger zone, Staph aureus will grow and will cause an infection. In, 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 in an individual. So again, keeping it cold, keeping it hot. And then I do mention Campylobacter, that's a, a gram-negative bacteria. You hear about that. I saw some outbreaks recently. That is really a lot to poultry, egg processing. So again, that would be something that would come from, from the environment with the with the food supply into the facility. So again, uh, something to be you know concerned about. But again, if you take care of the, the top six, you're going to pretty much take care of these. Next slide, please. And with all these, uh, uh, just as we've seen with the, even with the pandemic that we just recently experienced, there are individuals that are high risk from, from these foodborne illnesses. Most of us will actually have a staph infection, have norovirus, and really within 24 hours, we're over it. Uh, we know that there are uh, vulnerable populations out there. Uh, the older people uh, obviously get impacted more severely, and children. Um, E. coli in particular, I've seen many outbreaks with, with improperly processed hamburger. Uh, most adults can withstand that. Their bodies adjust to it. Uh, and actually the deaths and severe illnesses were related to, to the young people, children that, that were eating it. So again, we have to know what our, our, our market is, who we're serving, and make sure that our plan addresses that with regards to menus and practices. As you know, noted here, you know, one in six people will get a foodborne illness. Fortunately, you know, five and a half out of six recover from it. So, you know, but again, there are that those, those groups of people. Uh, we say they're pregnant people. I think that really should have been pregnant women. I don't think people in general get pregnant. But again, there's a lot of hospitalizations. And we relate this. It showed that in the, um, in the articles that I highlighted there. Today, health science, we can identify and track the source of these outbreaks. You know, years past, what happened, nobody really knew where it came from. Today, within a week or two, they identified that that, that high school was involved and they tracked it all through the upper Midwest. So again, your facility will not be immune if there's an outbreak related to it. They will be knocking your door uh, wanting to investigate it. Again, there's, uh, you know, we're so again, those high-risk individuals. And this is really now we talk about these food allergies. Again, not a foodborne illness but can impact people's health pretty, pretty severely. And I know this firsthand, I have uh, uh, a daughter-in-law that's uh, gluten uh, allergic to gluten. And then I have grandchildren that are allergic to eggs and, and, and nuts. And these uh, uh, allergic reactions, including anaphylactic shock, can be immediate, can actually happen right in the restaurant. So, and I know my daughter-in-law, she knows when she's gotten a bad, uh, she's been told that it was allergy-free or gluten-free. And then, and then she's sick that night. She knows where she got it. This information is shared. You got things like Yelp. So if somebody gets sick at your restaurant or in your establishment, you're going to be sharing that information out there. So we want to make sure our, our, our staff is trained. And we see that you go into restaurants and they'll come up and they'll say, 
are there any food allergies here? And and then all through the order process, they understand what that is, as opposed to, and I've seen this, you ask about a food allergy or allergens, and you get a, I don't know. Well, that's that would be a, a failure of that safety plan. Okay, we want to make sure that when we're processing these foods, we're preventing what we call cross contact. That is, you know, actually otherwise good food, but because it contains allergens, can actually cause that severe uh, adverse reaction. Uh, people may ask for an ingredient list. And we saw this with, and we'll talk about the nine uh, allergens that sesame uh, was just added this past year. And if you know sesame seeds, they get everywhere. So if you've got a bakery that has like one sesame uh, uh, item in the line, they can't prevent those sesames from getting to other products potentially. So they actually changed their recipes and added the minimum amount of sesame to the recipe so that they could put it on the label. You just can't put things on the label. It has to be, you know, a part of that formula. But they did that and it caught a lot of people on off guard because there were a lot of people that had been using products and never had a problem. And all of a sudden they weren't really reading the label anymore and they had an allergic reaction. So again, these are very key for our processors. And again, the food safety plan should be addressing all these. Next, please. And that is, these are the five risk factors identified by the CDC. Again, a, a safety plan is going to address these risk factors, uh, involves, and really has to involve with record keeping and uh, training and employment practices. But, you know, personal hygiene, we saw that with hand, contaminated hands. Again, where your for, food is coming from, how you're processing it, how you're holding it. And then, you know, again, what are you doing for that equipment to make sure that that contamination isn't spread? And it, with regards to personal hygiene, when they really looked into that, 81% or over 82% of the uh, hand washing was not uh, done uh, properly. So again, we, we assume people know how to wash their hands. We actually have to be reminding them and making sure that we're properly training them on that basic uh, food handling process. And gloving comes into that same uh, factor. So go to the next slide, please. So again, we get, you know, most of your facilities, if you're an operator, you know about getting your health code inspected or your health code inspections. And these, again, should be the same things that you're covering in your safety plan, making sure that the, the three compartment sinks are set up properly. Uh, then that they're, the temperatures and the, and the sanitizer concentrations are being checked routinely and recorded. Okay, and I've seen facilities that do a great job with this. Every half hour, somebody's out there checking and making record keeping of that. And then again, you know, how long they're being sanitized for. And if you have a, a high temperature dish machine that it's achieving that uh, uh, 180 degrees. And that was one actually in that E. coli outbreak, they found that their dishwasher was not achieving that. So again, became a, a, a violation. So again, this should be part of the safety plan. And next slide, please. So we added the, uh, we talked about those nine allergens, uh, color coding, and I know that's going to be talked about a little bit by Bill later, but, you know, color coding in the kitchen itself. We're kind of used to that. We see the red cutting boards for, you know, raw meats, uh, the yellow for the uh, raw poultry, the white for the, the breads and, and dairy products, cheeses, the green for the produce and fruits, the brown for the, uh, uh, the cooked meats, and then the, uh, the, the light blue for the seafood. And now, Available are, you know, allergy free, which would be the purple. So you would have a section, if you possible, where you would have purple tools, so that they know that these are only being used for allergy free. And there's your uh, nine allergens. That's your, you know, your peanuts, your wheat, your fish, eggs, shellfish, tree nuts, milk, soy, and now your sesame. So again, we're going to make sure that we're processing and building that into the plan. So again, uh, last slide, please. And then, so to summarize, uh, you know, what these, uh, what we're trying to avoid with that, our plan, you know, and we're trying to avoid things like poor cleaning and sanitizing, and that'll be addressed a little bit uh, here next with um, our next expert. But we're also trying to avoid that product contamination that has to do that cross contact uh, with allergens, as well as contaminating raw with, with ready to eat products, time temperature abuse. That's where it's not being, again, we're trying to avoid that temperature danger zone, keeping hot foods hot, cold foods cold, and then, you know, making sure that they're only, um, the, t the times involved with those storages uh, are appropriate. And then the big thing there is poor personal hygiene. And much of that really, that is a management practice that can be uh, 
you know, managed, you know, in terms of what our employees do, we can control that. Uh, some of the other things are a little less under our control, but poor personal hygiene is something that we should be able to address in our operations. And so at this point, I will be turning it over to um, Mr. Jim Leedy, who is our Director of Chemical Sales here at Imperial Dave. Thank you, John. And uh, thanks for everyone for your participation in today's call. Uh, again, Jim Leedy, I'm the Director of Chemical Sales for Imperial Dade. And what we're gonna address today is food safety as it relates to chemistry, but more important, specific chemicals, while they're always important by themselves, are only a piece of the puzzle to our overall cleaning programs and procedures. So let's jump into proper chemistry. Next slide, please. You know, if we look at proper chemistry as a key component in breaking the chain of infection to some of the uh, infectious diseases that John illustrated, but understanding proper chemistry is the use of the right chemical for the right application, which is always consistent in a manner with the product label itself. We never want to deviate from that product labeling. As we look at number two, we talk about the consistency of proper cleaning procedures. It elevates both the aesthetics and the operational effectiveness of your facility. And some of the ramifications that could occur were illustrated by both John and Bill in some of their examples. We think about what does proper chemistry do for our environment of not only our workers, but it's also a safe environment for our customers as well. And then chemistry is great when done right, but when done wrong, it can be dangerous. So let's take a look at some of the right and some of the wrong. There's, all, there's a right way, as you'll see in green, but there's also a wrong way. So next slide, please. If you'll note in the slide here, to the left, the wrong way. We've taken a couple of pictures and we see that we have open chemical jugs. Potential there is product contamination, as well as employee exposure to the concentrate. We have non-labeled chemical solutions. This gets makes us out of compliant with the right to know loss. And then we have a dispensed chemical container with the top cut off, again, with the potential of exposure of the concentrated product to the employee. If you'll notice the slide on the right, this is the wrong way. Now notice, you will develop a false sense of security when you see a dispensing system on the wall, but don't let that always lead you into you're doing the proper thing. If you'll notice in the picture here, it's a nice installation, but the chemical lines are placed improperly. Both the sanitizer and the detergent are in the rinse sink. So it's up to the employee at this point to separate those into the right sinks, or we're gonna get inconsistent results. You'll also notice back on the slide up previous that we had non-labeled chemical lines. And more important in this particular picture here, the sanitizer is too close to the wash sink. So we're gonna have a, a tendency to cross contaminate from the sink to the third sanitizing sink. Next slide, please. Here's an example of the right way. You'll notice that the chemical has a jug with a lid on it. It's closed loop. There's no potential for contamination or for the employee to become exposed to the concentrate. The labeled chemical solutions for proper identification of what the product is. And then you have proper dispensing on the wall. On the right side, you'll see an example of a three sink, right? The sinks are labeled in correct order, wash, rinse, sanitize from left to right or right to left. You've got adequate hose length, so the, dis the hose is not sitting in the solution. You've got clearly labeled dispensers, as well as the visual aids or wall charts. Next slide, please. Again, an example of the wrong way. Cut off gallon jugs filled with solution. And in this particular picture here, it's not so much the dispenser we're looking at, but it's looking at the storage on the table of the third sink. You'll notice here that we have chemicals placed on that third sink 
that are leading to contamination possibilities of the sanitizer. As exposed to the right side of the picture here, you'll see that the chemicals are properly labeled and the chemical lines are color coded. Again, making this easier for our employees to follow the correct cleaning procedures. Next slide, please. So what are some of the consequences? One is the soaring cost. Again, inadequate safety practices can lead to significant financial losses. John illustrated that social media is an expensive uh, uh, to potentially rebuild your brand in the community or in the nation. There's also the potential to foodborne illness outbreaks, you know, skipping any kind of precaution that you should be doing in a consistent manner of clean is going to break that chain of infection. Uh, increased contamination risk without following these proper procedures. We're always going to be able to escalate and compromise our quality of food and the safety of our employees, but also the safety of our customers as well. And then we also have the issue of downtime. So I would always say that if you have seen anything within these slides that created a question regarding your facility or for customer, uh, we're going to have the questions at the end. But uh, please reach out for a site survey and we'll be glad to speak to this in an in-depth manner. So with that, I thank you for your time. Bill. Thank you, Jim. I hope everybody can hear me OK. I'm having a little technical difficulty here, so I'm working smoke and mirrors to, to try and get us through the uh, the webinar. So um, my, my portion here is to talk a little bit about methodologies and customer perceptions, and we'll have a few cleaning tips along the way as well. So the, uh, the next slide talks about protecting the food. Obviously, we want to shield that from any cleaning agents. Um, if we're doing any cleaning around open food, that should be covered, probably put away. Um, it's also the first step in cleaning any of our our, uh, our wear wash materials, our, our dishes, our pots, pans, et cetera, is to get those food scraps out of the way so that our cleaners can do a better job. So move on to the next slide, and we'll talk a little bit about TACT. Um, TACT is an acronym that I use quite often in, in my training, particularly with cleaning professionals. Um, and it, the acronym stands for Time, Agitation, Concentration, and Temperature. Time, obviously, dwell time is important when we talk about sanitizing and disinfecting. We need to hit certain milestones with a particular product. Otherwise, we're not truly sanitizing, we're possibly disinfecting. So that dwell time certainly aids in the cleaning process. A lot of us grew up watching 409 commercials on TV, but not everything that we use is truly a spray and wipe. But while time aids us in the cleaning process, it is mandatory for sanitizing and disinfecting. Jim talked about using products in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. Well, that's the first line on, on the labels for disinfectants. It's a federal violation because these products are regulated as pesticides by the Environmental Protection Agency here in the United States. When we talk about agitation, you know, scrapers, squeegees, cloths, et cetera, the things you see on the list there, Obviously, that's to, to, to move that soil, break that soil loose so that it can be uh, washed or rinsed away. When we look at concentrations. We're talking about concentrations of our chemicals. And Jim even mentioned that you know, more is not better. We need to follow the directions. One of the reasons I always press following the directions is because if things go wrong and the product doesn't perform for you the way you think it should, if we followed the directions, it's usually easier to figure out what went wrong. Maybe it was just the wrong product for that application. But when people make up their own recipes, it's very hard to duplicate the, the mistake, and therefore it makes it much harder for us to, to, to determine the best path forward. So again, more is not better. If a little bit's good, more is not better, and less could be even worse, because now we're really not getting anywhere near the, the sanitizing or cleaning uh, requirements that we have. And then temperature, usually in the cleaning world, I'll tell people for my money, that's the least important of the four. But in this world, in the food sanitation world, that's a completely different conversation. Obviously, you've got different temperature requirements for freezers, walk-ins, walk dishwashers, 
your three compartment sinks, even the compartments within the sinks have different temperature requirements. So it's important that, that people understand that. We don't put our sanitizer in a three compartment sink in very hot water because the sanitizer could flash off and now it's not providing the, uh, the sanitizing that, that we put it in there for. So moving on, I want to talk a little bit about color coding. Sorry, folks, I'm even in a room with uh, automatic lights here. Everything's working against me today. So color coding just helps us identify the tools that we're using for various processes. Uh, John talked about it with the cutting boards and different types of food, but it's, I think it's important to have your color coding set up for all cleaning within your operation, certainly in the back of the house, but also in the front of the house. Because again, I think customers are, are viewing this differently than they may have pre-pandemic. Everyone kind of realized how important cleaning was as we were coming through the pandemic. Frankly, I'm not sure why they didn't understand that ahead of time, but it certainly heightened people's awareness. So I think if you have color-coded cloths and, and pails and your, your mops and buckets, everything has a, a purpose and you're using it for that purpose. And when we color code that, I think it just helps, uh, helps present your, your operation in a more professional manner. And it also helps us to prevent that, that cross contact, which leads to cross contamination. So again, it's highly recommended. We have, you know, we have these things available and we can certainly bring them to bear for your operation. So let's look at a few smart practices. Um, proper chemical labeling. Now, I'll be the first to admit that our spray bottles to the right there, that, that one that has the green check is not really an appropriate label for a disinfectant. But what we're trying to drive home here is we should have appropriate labels for what the product is. And once that bottle is labeled, no other product should ever go into it. Um, proper labeling is key so that we understand where that oftentimes we'll have first aid uh, suggestions on those labels and things like that. We need to have that information on there. Um, mop bucket practices. We've got the, the picture of the mop bucket there. And frankly, I think the, uh, the dirty cleaning solution in the bottom of that bucket is much cleaner than many that I've encountered in my career. Um, leaving that bucket of who knows what sitting around is frankly an OSHA violation. Once we're done with the bucket, that solution should be emptied. The bucket should be rinsed and, and allowed to dry. But oftentimes that bucket just gets shoved back in a corner or in a closet, and we don't really know what's in there, what it's used for, and that can lead to many, many different problems. Um, safe chemical mixing. We, we want to make sure that we are following directions, and certainly if we have a dilution control system, that takes a lot of the guesswork out. Um, but even those things need to be checked periodically to make sure that they're dispensing or diluting products efficiently. And then chemical use training is key. Your employees need to understand the chemicals they're working with and the risks associated with them. Um, many of you probably recall back in 2019, probably around the time COVID was on the verge of breaking out, in the fall of 2019 in Massachusetts, a Buffalo Wild Wings manager died because of improper chemical mixing. There was a product on the floor. Someone was told to go mop the floor. They added another product to it. The fumes cleared the restaurant out in seconds. The manager went into the kitchen to try and squeegee that mess out into the parking lot, and he ended up dying. They got him to the hospital, but he never went home. So it is so critical that your people understand how to use the chemicals or products properly, but also what to avoid when they are using them. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little about staff training. Everyone knows it's required, um, but oftentimes it's it's uh, sort of on the, pardon the pun, it's, it's often put on the back burner. So we want to talk about how to shape some successful behaviors by proper training. So next slide, please. So we realize that training is, is a necessity. And it's an ongoing necessity and turnover just adds to that, that challenge. But what we really need to do is understand what training is vital to the operation, and especially with new team members, because they often come to you and they may tout their experience, but as, uh, as, your, as your experience may prove, they're, they're not always as sharp as they say they are. 
So again, we want to make sure that we have that common base level knowledge with all of our folks. And go beyond telling. The, the old saying is telling is not training. And frankly, neither is yelling. Um, our marketing department would let me put my picture of Gordon Ramsay on this slide. But, you know, that, that idea of just shouting at people is not training. And in fact, it works against us more often than not. So we want to make sure that people are engaged in the learning. Dedicate some time for it, whether you're doing it in the kitchen, because maybe you're going over some operation within the kitchen, but maybe it's something a little where you could actually sit down, take a few moments. And I think it's important sometimes to set the training aside, not always do it on the fly. Yes, sometimes you have to, but it's really important to take time out periodically and try to be consistent in when you do it, whether it's you know the first Wednesday at after the lunch rush or whatever your operation might allow, find that time to take some time and, and dedicate that to training. Um, and, and tailor your approaches because adults learn differently. The, um, we don't, we're not sponges like little children. You know, kids are, are sponges. Their brains are, have, have a lot of room in there. But as adults, we've got a lot of stuff going on. So it's important to try and hit on multiple senses um, some people, you know, they can read a document and they're good to go. They, they, it sticks forever. Other people could read it five minutes later. They, they, they're on to something else and they're, they're not really sure what they read. Uh, they know they read something, but they're not sure what. So we may need to find some other activities to engage them. And again, we don't train just for the sake of training. We train to mold, to strengthen and, and alter the workplace behaviors. So. So what are some keys to successful training? Next slide, please. We'll look at planning. And that's where he actually takes time to think about what do your folks need to know? And oftentimes you want to identify that the training needs and where do training needs exist? Well, there are the gap between what your employees do know and what they need to know. So it may be just a fact of sitting down and thinking about all the things that you want to make sure they understand within your operation. You're not going to get to all of them every, you know, in, in one setting. That's why, again, ongoing training is much more effective. So take the time to plan that. Know your audience. And you may be thinking, well, what do you mean know my audience? These people work for me. Yes, they work for you, but understand where they're coming from. Oftentimes, you know, we want to understand, uh, are there language or literacy issues? I'm often asked, well, do you have that training in Spanish? Well, we might have it in Spanish, but just because we've had it translated onto a document, that doesn't mean that the person who may be challenged with English can, is necessarily literate in Spanish either. So again, try to understand some of the, the obstacles you may have to overcome. We talk about preparing. Again, know the material. You know, sometimes you may need to read up a little bit, you know, bone up on it so that you're ready for the questions that may come, but know the material and understand what, what do your employees need to know versus what would be nice to know. And again, if you're trying to confine this into the, the, the few moments that you have available for training, focus on the need to know versus the nice to know. Have props or handouts, maybe do a little demonstration for folks. Again, doing something tactile for some folks, again, helps it stick. And then execute the training. You know, welcome your folks into the training and, and try to get them to relax because oftentimes, especially if it's new, they're a little hesitant about it and they have some, some reservations. So try to welcome them, make them feel comfortable, speak slowly, take your time with this. Don't rush through it because again, you're gonna lose some folks along the way. And it's okay to have fun with your training, but never have fun at the trainee's expense. I typically, throw rocks at myself when I'm in front of folks and I want to have some fun with the training. And that usually, you know, lightens the mood a little bit. And again, try to hit as many senses as you can, allow for questions and allow for mistakes also. So helping to seal the learning experience, again, the affirmation, take time at the end of the training, express confidence in your folks. I think the five most important words in training are, I know you've got this and express that confidence in them. And, but tell them, if you're not sure, ask. You'd rather have them ask you the question five times than make the mistake once. So again, affirm your belief in their ability to move forward. 
some key takeaways. Hit the key points that you want to make sure that they that they remember. But don't go through the entire training again. Just hit those key points. And again, make sure that everyone's questions have been answered. Oftentimes, when I conduct training in front of a group of people, I'll ask, any questions? Nobody has a question. Okay, thanks for your time. As I start closing up my stuff, now they walk up and they ask the questions. So, again, make sure that they have the opportunity to answer all of their questions. So what sort of resources do we have available for you? Um, within Imperial Dade, we have a number of things that you can lean on. Our restaurant uh, program outline and trainer guide is a program that we put together back during the pandemic for our sales consultants to come in and help you with the training for your folks to make sure that we're hitting the key points to help keep your, your, uh, your customers safe when they come into your establishment. We've also got wall charts. That's another great thing to use as part of your training. If you've got the wall charts, it's a constant reminder of the steps or the processes that you want folks to follow. And then we have our environmental service program. That's our wear wash and, and our chemical management systems. That's part of you know, what Jim leads for the, for the organization. And again, we can bring that to bear for your, for your operation. And our high protection zone covers a, a number of different types of facilities. And again, is really stressing those frequently touched surfaces and things like that to help keep our, our folks safe. So um, one other thing I want to talk about in resources are those secondary labels. Again, I mentioned it with the spray bottles, but if you have a product that has come out of a, you know, maybe it was a concentrate and now it's in a ready to use spray bottle, you need to make sure that it has proper label on it. So at this point, I'm going to hand it back over to Brian and uh, see if we have any questions that we need to answer for you all. We do. Thank you guys for that, uh, all the insight there and important information as we talked about earlier. Uh, it's a very important topic on so many levels, so appreciate everything that you guys had to offer. There are a couple of questions here. Uh, again, while I'm reading these off, if you have some, feel free to enter them through the chat link or the Q&A link. One of them here that we've got, Lindsay asks, how often should different surfaces and equipment be cleaned and sanitized? Okay, I'll, I'll address that one. And again, really, it's pretty simple. It's uh, uh, whenever you, well, I guess it's not so simple. Uh, whenever you're changing the type of food that you're doing, if you go into a, you know, a deli and you'll see they're using a slicer for the lunch meats, they should only be using that for lunch meats. And they can actually keep doing lunch meats on that slicer. Uh, and then obviously cheeses would be done on a different slicer. If you're switching between different types of foods, theoretically that should be uh, cleaned in between that. Uh, four hours of operation. So if that slice is being used constantly for four hours, it should be then broken down and cleaned. Uh, so that, and again, that has to do with that time temperature abuse issue because uh, that slicer obviously is not being kept at that refrigerated temperature. And then uh, whenever the work is interrupted, so a worker has to leave a station that they're working on, they come back an hour later, that area should be cleaned. And then uh, whenever you're moving between um, like raw and, and, and ready to eat products would be another area that you have to fully clean that surface before moving on. Um, and then I'll actually, while I'm on uh, that question about food safety training, Serve Safe is a, a nationally recognized uh, program offered by the National Restaurant Association, third party certification on food safety management. So again, your managers uh, can be uh, certified in certain public health, depends on what the public health requirements are, but most of the time they require that somebody be certified in some sort of food safety program uh, and be on premises whenever foods are being processed. So again, a serve safe program, and there are other ones out there, but serve safe is probably the, the best known. Sorry, I'm having my own technical challenges. Uh, one other question that did come into are all sanitizers created equal or how do you know what you need for which space or application? Well, concerning the uh, sanitizers used in a food service establishment, you want to make sure that you're using a food contact safe sanitizer uh, at the proper dilution ratio as required by the labeling and with this specific amount of dwell time that the proper label that Bill had alerted to. But it's primarily going to be either a quat based or a chlorine based sanitizer that's safe for food service. Uh, you do want to make sure that the sanitizer you're using is 
uh, if it does require a rinse or if it does not require a rinse as part of your cleaning. So as you know, a lot of these questions are as it relates to your specific location. I don't want to create a blanket answer for all locations. So again, uh, if there's a specific application, I uh, would be glad to address that specifically. But uh, again, you know, the, the overall answer is quat based or chlorine based and food contact safe. Very good, thank you. I don't see any other questions coming through here. So again, thank you gentlemen for uh, all of the insight today. Can't appreciate or can't tell you how much we appreciate uh, all this content on the, again, this very important topic. I uh, wanna give one more shout out to our sponsors and thanking them for making this happen. Georgia Pacific and Clorox, uh, important partners of ours on many levels and everything that we're doing on a daily basis. So thank you to those. I do believe that Morgan is putting in the chat room the information for the next webinar, you guys should be on the lookout for, oh, there's a slide up, uh, for an email to get registered for the next one coming up on April 17th, it looks like. It'd be a, a nice follow-up or supplement to the content that you heard today. Uh, it's more specific though to the food processing. So keep your eyes peeled for, for that to come down the pipeline. And with that, I know we are over time. We appreciate the extra time that everybody put in and sticking around. Thank you everybody for joining joining and uh, we look forward to being online with you again on April 17th. So thank you very much.